Oh, hello. It's noon and I think we'll get started. Um, hello and welcome to today's webinar on Selvia. My name is Lara and I'm the Community Outreach Director at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. I am joined today by our local hero, Mary McGuire Lerman. How's it going, Mary? Pretty good. It's been a busy day, as you know. <laughs> it sounds like you were gardening at several, several locations today. Yes. <laughs> Well, um, thanks for being here today, Mary. Um, and a quick note on membership. If you're not a member of MSHS, now is a good time to join. Our members receive not only our award-winning magazine, The Northern Gardener, but also discounts at nurseries and greenhouses, uh, complimentary tickets to our local home show, free webinars, and so much more. Your membership dollars also allow us to bring great programming like this to all of you. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we begin. You are attending the webinar today in listen-only mode, so you will be able to hear our presenter, Mary, but we can't hear you. That way, we won't have background noise. If you have questions for Mary, you can type those in on the panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, Mary likes to answer questions throughout the webinar, right, Mary? Is that okay? That's fine. Okay, so she's happy to do that. So if um, you have a question as it arises, um, type it into that question pane on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and now, uh, please welcome today's speaker, Mary Frances McGuire Lerman. Good morning. Uh, yeah, Mary uh, was the oldest daughter of eight kids and she was the gardener of the family. When she entered college, she discovered horticulture science at the University of Minnesota. She graduated in 1974 with a degree in horticultural science and immediately began working at Como Conservatory. In 1976, she was hired away by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, where she worked for 32 years as a horticulturist designing, directing, expanding garden operations, creating the naturalist program at the Eloise Butler Wildflower Garden, initiating the invasive species, species removal programs, and working for five years with state agencies to get Buckthorn Declare a restricted noxious weed in Minnesota to prevent any further propagation or sale. Mary has been preparing numerous webinars for MSHS on a variety of genera of flowering plants. Um, and we really appreciate it. I think this is our third one this month, isn't it, Mary? Yep, yes it yep. is, and we are coming. Yep, more coming. Um, she's looking forward to sharing her information with you today and learning from you with your questions and comments. So take it away, Mary. Okie doke. Um, I guess it's afternoon, morning. Um, so I wanna start with the cover photo here. This is one I took when we went out to the 4th of July at Medora in North Dakota last summer, which is right next to Teddy Roosevelt Nash. Um, look at how both of the colors just are so vibrant. Um, this is because you take a bluish hole, which is on one of the color scale or the color wheel and match it uh, another color that's exactly opposite from there. So oranges and yellows, blues and purples are great contrasting colors. But notice also how you can see the special feature of this salvia, this perennial salvia called Caradonia. Um, it is, um, has a maroon purplish flower stem and then the, the purplish blue flowers um, come out from that. And so when you have, instead of a green stem, but a dark maroon to black, the purple stem, it makes those flowers really shine. So before we go any further, I wanna mention that this is going to be your private tour of salvias. We're gonna be talking about medicinal, annual, biennial, and perennial salvias. And each year when my husband and I go on a trip, to a new city, we always take what is called a free walking tour. And indeed the tour is free, but at the very beginning of the tour, the guide mentions that um, although it's a free tour, 
at the end of the tour, if you feel like you learned a lot and it was worth something to you, then please make a donation. And so I'm asking you to do that today to the Hort Society. If you feel that what I've relayed to you is of some value, please go ahead and make a donation at the end because the Hort Society needs our help just like every other nonprofit in this um, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that's all I'm gonna say. Let's go on to Salvia's. Okay, Salvia, why is not going? Hold on a minute. There we go. So we have to start with a poem. Um, in these times of fashionable rages, let us honor enduring sages, known to cure, to mend, to ease, companions to cooks, splendid teas. Hundreds of species are world adorned, richly diverse in flower and form. Hail to Salvia, that scented salvation, worthy of study and our admiration. So this is Andy Doty who wrote this. I found him online, but I had no way to reach him. So we're just crediting him this way. The image below is from the city of Montreal where we visited a few years ago, where they had clipped boxwood hedges and a variety of salvias and other annuals mixed in. And then to the right is an image of, um, I think that's at Edinburgh Botanic Garden in Scotland of one of the new blue salvias. And the image is so small, I can't read the name for you, but it's an annual one. Okay, so salvia facts. Um, as you can see from the map, salvias can be found all around the world. Um, we have some that are native here in the US, Central America, South America, and you can see in Europe, into Asia, Africa, and even into Australia. In fact, some of the great new um, annual salvias that have come on the market in recent years, the Wishes series, um, Kisses and Wishes, Wendy's Wishes, Love and Wishes, um, were all bred in Australia. And the reason they have the name Wishes in them is because every time you buy one of those plants, um, a donation is made to Make-A-Wish Foundation of Australia. So it's a member of the mint family. Everything in the mint family has square stems. So if you've grown mint, if you've grown hyssop, salvias, they all have square stems. There's over 900 species of salvia found around the world. Their cousins are Nepeta, otherwise known as cat mint, Monarda, which is bee balm, and Perovskia, as it comes from Russia, is Russian sage. They have square stems and they have very fragrant leaves. And by fragrant, I mean, let's, let's use the term fragrant as not being a pleasing odor necessarily. And as a result, it is very repellent to deer and rabbits. Um, the name comes from the Latin salvari, which means to heal or save. And we'll get into that in a minute. And many of the perennial salvias that we grow here in the US are native to the temperate regions of Eurasia. It has, um, many of the salvias have a candelabra bloom shape and is likely what inspired the shape of the Jewish menorah as reported to us by Dr. Avraham Alevi of Hebrew University in Rehovot, Israel. Um, I heard him speak when he gave a seminar on plants of the Bible in 1979 at the Kermit Olson Memorial Lecture at the University of Minnesota. Quite an amazing man. Um, Dr. Halevi was responsible for introducing Leatris as a cut flower to the world. Also all those very colorful wax plant, the spray stems um, and the, um, St. St. John's wort with the colorful berries. Uh, culinary and medicinal salvias. So this is what we have. And for Minnesota, these are all annuals for us. However, in salvia officinalis, I had several of the colorful varieties, the Icterina um, and the purple over winter this year because we received a very good snow cover last fall before our weather got severe. A complete contrast to the winter before when we had the polar vortex. 
Otherwise, the others that are mentioned here, and you'll notice rosemary is there. We'll talk about that in a minute. Salvia is now officially a rosemary after DNA research. So culinary or medicinal salvias, um, known as sage, common sage or garden sage is a perennial that grows to a height of three feet um, with blue violet blooms in summer, but not here in Minnesota. It's pretty much a low grower for us getting maybe six to 10 inches tall. Uh, originated in Southeastern Europe, um, the area of Alba Albania and Bosnia. And today, although it's cultivated in some European countries, such as Albania, Bulgaria, Croatia, Germany, Poland, Roman, Romania, Serbia, Montenegro, and Spain, and in the US, more than half of the world's medicinal supply is still wild collected, mainly in Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Croatia, Serbia, and Montenegro with increasing amounts of it being wild collected under organic certification. So sage leaves are chewed whole. I can do that in the garden. It's a very medicinal plant. We'll talk about it in a minute. It can be dried and ground into a powder. Often it, sage is called for um, stuffing for Thanksgiving for the turkeys. So if you grow your own, you'll have some really nice, powerful sage to use. It is prepared and sold as a fluid extract, a tincture or essential oil, or it can be pressed fresh for the juice. Salvia is a fairly large genus containing hundreds of species not addressed in this profile, which are employed for a wide variety of applications in traditional medicine, particularly in the regions to which these are native. And aside from Salvia officinalis, the, the common garden sage, um, the most notable of these, as far as medicinal, are the Chinese sage root, uh, Salvia miltiorhiza, and Salvia divinorum leaves, which is a hip, reputed hallucinogenic, hallucinogenic plant from Mexico. And for Salvia officinalis, officinalis refers to the plant's medicinal use. The officina was the traditional storeroom of a monastery where herbs and medicines were stored. So take a look at those three colorful varieties. You can get plain officinalis, which has a greenish gray leaf. Uh, purpurescence, I've frequently had over winter. This is the first year I've had icterina over winter. Um, I have not yet ever had tricolor over winter. Um, good snow cover early is important for that to happen. But both, all three of these are great to use, for example, in rock gardens and in containers, especially the low front part of the container. Okay, so sage and medicine. I have, end a quick, oh, I have a okay. quick question for you here, Mary. Um, yep. Can you grind Icterina? I don't Does know, I can't answer you? that. I would assume, yes, you could, but I would check that you know, with a medicinal authority, you could go online. There's a, a number of excellent sources. If you just put in medicinal question about sage ictorina, um, I'm sure they, there'll be someone there to answer it for you. Okay, thank you. Sure. So the old Arabian proverb, because these are plants that you're gonna find, particularly in the Middle East, used a lot. How can a man die who has sage in his garden? This was a really critical medicinal herb. And it was used in the four thieves vinegar that it was employed during the pandemic black plague. Um, the specific vinegar composition is said to have been used during the med medieval period to prevent the catching of this dreaded disease. And other similar types of herbal vinegars have been used as medicine since the time of Hippocrates. Um, Early recipes for this vinegar called for a number of herbs to be added into a vinegar solution and left to steep for several days. Um, the following vinegar recipe hung in the Museum of Paris in 1937 and is said to have been an original copy of the recipe posted on the walls of Marseille during an episode of the plague. So this vinegar mix was take three pints of strong white wine vinegar, add a handful each of wormwood, meadow sweet, wild marjoram and sage, 50 cloves, that would make it very pungent, 
um, two ounces of Campanula, uh, which is bellflower roots. God, I wonder if we could use that invasive evil weed, the creeping bellflower from Europe for that. Two ounces of angelica, rosemary, and whorehound in three large measures of camphor. That must have been one stinky vinegar. You place the mixture in a container for 15 days, strain it, express it, and then bottle. And use it by rubbing it on the hands, ears, and temples from time to time when approaching a plague victim. So why is it called four thieves vinegar? Because there were four thieves that were operating in this one city during the plague. And so they were captured and their sentence was that they were responsible for picking up all of the bodies from the Black Plague and taking them to a cemetery or a, a burn site. So this is what they came up to protect themselves. Now, some of the theories of why it may have worked is that many of these herbs are repellent to insects. And of course, it was an insect that spread the Black Plague pandemic. Hmm, interesting. I do have a quick question about essential oil. I went the wrong way. Hold on. Nope, still going back. There we go. All right. Um, so clary sage essential oil comes from which sage? Does that make sense to you? Clary sage, which sage? Um, it, comes from the, it comes from the clary sage, which is salvia viridis. And we'll see a picture of that coming up soon. It was also used to make alcohol um, stronger. Interesting, thanks. Okay, so next we have one of the most aromatic foliage sage this, that are, that is definitely smells of pineapple. Um, it's a sh sub shrub that's native to the edges of pine and oak forest in the Sierra Madre del Sur, mountains of Mexico and Guatemala. And it was introduced as a garden plant in 1870. It's hardy only in zones eight through 11. So here it is an annual. Um, the common name of pineapple sage comes from the scent of the leaves when crushed, although the strength of the aroma will vary depending on weather and moisture collections. Now, the species has generally a plain green foliage um, and then the bright red flowers, but this new one that you should be able to find, and I've seen it in a number of garden centers this spring, which is a knockout because I love chartreuse foliage, is rock and gold and delicious. Now, you need to know that these salvias, the pineapple sages, do not bloom until later summer. But if you have the rock and golden delicious, then you have a wonderful foliage uh, bazinga for your garden. Okay, so now we know raspberry, uh, raspberry rosemary is now a salvia. Um, and this was announced last fall. Rosemary is undergoing a change in scientific name after research has shown that it is in fact a salvia. Um, the Royal Botanic Society um, has been doing research for many years, uh, DNA research to really check plants accuracy as far as how they are divided into genera. Um, and so um, in the past, for example, black cohosh, which used to be Simus fuga racemosa, when that whole group was studied, they switched its Latin name to Actea racemosa, and um, coleus went from coleus to solana stemmen, and I can't, it's scutellarioides, something like that as far as the species. And so there are name changes going on, and they are doing this just to make you upset. They're doing it to properly classify. It's kind of like um, plantancestry.com. Let's put it that way. So rosemary and salvias have been classified as two entirely separate genera since the plant naming system began with Linnaeus in 1753. Uh, the stamens of the plants were deemed to be similar, but not enough to warrant identifying them as one plant type. So that decision has now been changed following DNA research and will be reflected in the next issue of the Royal Hort Society's Plant Finder. Now, if you look at the photo, you're seeing the wonderful um, violet blue flowers that you see on rosemary. But this does not, in most cases, in fact, I've never seen it bloom here 
in Minnesota because we don't have a long enough growing season. But this is an image of it outside the old city of Jerusalem that I took last fall. This was in November um, where it was still heavily blooming there in the Middle East, the rosemary is, is like a, a shrub and a ground cover. And once you put it in and get it established, it's there forever. Nobody buys fresh rosemary at the stores. They just go out and harvest some from their garden or on a shrub, you know, somewhere in their neighborhood. So here we get to annual clary, where we have the question about salvia viridis uh, or the clary, um, was the question the clary essential oil. Um, again, the salvias were some of the earliest plants recorded by Linnaeus, and it wasn't just his work. There were botanists around the world that were sending plant samples to him to study. So 1753 is when Linnaeus first started documenting um, salvias and putting them into that, that genus. So it's native to Southern Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia. It needs a full sun site, and it prefers poor, drier soils. Do not fertilize this plant. Even though Linnaeus recorded it in 1753, it was introduced to England in 1596 by earlier explorers. It's best if you direct seed it in soil, but I know in recent years that um, the Rush Creek growers are a wholesale grower that supply many independent garden centers here in the metropolitan Twin Cities area um, have been growing this in six packs. But otherwise, just direct seed into the soil once our soil temps are warm. And I think we're finally approaching the level where I would seed it. Um, and the seeds and the leaves of this plant were once added to fermenting vats to increase the inebriating quality of the liqueur. Just what you wanted to learn about salvias today. So now we've looked at the medicinal, now we're gonna look at ornamental annual salvias. And there's quite a group of them that we can grow as annual plants that are knockouts in our garden. So from, the, from Mexico and Central America, we have salvia cocinea. Uh, we have the mealy cup sage, which I just was involved with getting a bunch of those planted this morning. Salvia farinacea, Victoria blue and Victoria white are, one of the, are some of the common older varieties. We'll see more later. Uh, salvia gregi, which has very small leaves. It's called the autumn or Texas sage because that's where it's from. Uh, salvia guaranatica is native to Argentina. Um, and it's called the anise or hummingbird sage. This one is a knockout for bringing hummingbirds into your garden in mid to later summer into fall. They will continue blooming right up to a hard frost. So they're great when we have the migrating hummingbirds in the fall. Salvia leucantha, nobody's growing it around here, but I'm, I'm gonna try to get one in from online because I'd like to try it on my deck, which is very hot, sunny, and extremely windy. Uh, the Mexican bush sage is grown around the world in hot, sunny, dry areas. It's very prevalent in California um, and, and of course Mexico, and I'll show you some images from Israel too. Salvia microphylla, the baby or gram sage, microphylla, tiny leaves, also like Gray guy has very tiny leaves. They tend to, both gray guy and microphylla have much smaller flowers than most other salvias, but they still bring in the hummingbirds and the, and the butterflies to pollinate. Now, one of my favorite um, sages because of its color, the gentian sage has ultramarine blue flowers. And I think they're the largest flowers you're ever gonna see on a salvia. And these are also being grown by Rush Creek and are available for sale at independent garden centers in the metro area. And they are sold in six packs. Now, if when you buy them, they're tall and leggy, just give them a haircut like most of us desperately need. Um, and if their roots are compacted, just butterfly the roots. That's where you go in and slice at the bottom of the root mass 
and spread the, the roots out so it looks like two butterfly leaves. Put them in the ground, they will root a lot faster that way. I'm gonna have to get water here in a minute. Salvia splendens, the scarlet sage. This is what I remember growing up as far as being the only sage out there in garden centers in the 1960s and 70s. But there are some tremendous breeding operations that have happened crossing this with other species. And I'm gonna show you Roman red in a few minutes, which I think is the most exciting red sage on the market. And it's out there this year for the first time. And then we have a number of interspecific salvias where they're hybrids between some of the varieties here, or they may be hybrids with some of the many other hundreds of salvia species that we mentioned earlier. And now I need to just take a short break for water. So um, Laura, do you have any more questions? I do. Um, Doris would like to know if salvia is invasive, like other um, others in the mint family? Absolutely not. That's what's great about it. Yep. And then Michael would like to know, um, he says, my salvia always collapse midsummer, and I never have any luck cutting them back to reflower. What's the best, or what's the secret to getting a second bloom? Okay. Um, salvia, if you can think about many of them, like drier soil. So Last year was horrible for a lot of salvia because we had the highest rainfall on record ever in the state of Minnesota. So when you have saturated soils, what plants do, um, and it doesn't matter whether they're an annual perennial, a shrub or a tree, is their lower roots start dying out and they develop more of their roots in the upper soil surface where they can get more oxygen. And so we may have seen this a lot in perennial sages last year, primarily because of the excessive moisture. Um, but I was talking to Teresa Burton, who is the gardener over at Longfellow Gardens, and she said she found, for example, that Salvia caradonia was um, problematic for her um, because it seemed the more moist the soils were, the more it would would falter and start to die back. So I think it's mainly a soil situation tied in with a moisture situation, which is causing that decline. Um, if you are um, if you are watering, I would I would suggest, especially if you're hand watering with the with the nozzle, is to avoid watering your perennial salvias as much as you would some of your other perennials that are in that same garden. Any other questions? That's it for now. Oh, okay. actually one, one more oh. just popped in. Okay. Um, is prairie sage in the salvia family? Prairie sage is artemisia. Artemisia, um, yep. Um, now, I don't think so, but I can't tell you for sure. I'm going to have to look that up afterwards so that maybe we can save that question. You could email it to me, and then I can research it and reply back. I have a that feeling, good. I feel, feeling it is. The one problem with prairie sage, it's gorgeous in prairies because it is controlled by prairie grasses that surround it. When you take it out of a prairie where it has grassroots that are going to keep it in check and you put it in a, a general garden where you have rich soil, lots of space, this thing is going to move like wildfire. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, one more question. Um, let's see. I have seen perennial salvia, White Hill and Blue Hill. Are yes. they true perennials? Mine have disappeared after a few years. Okay, they are true perennials. Um, it may have to do again with soil moisture. If you have heavy, I didn't mention this early, if you have heavy clay soils, um, you may have difficulty with sages because clay soils will hold much more moisture. And White Hill and Blue Hill are some of the oldest cultivars of perennial sage 
on the market. Um, so if you've had trouble with it in the past and it's not, and you don't have a heavy clay soil and you don't have an irrigation system that's going running amok and soaking them, um, I would suggest you try some others. Now, you're not seeing this online right now, but I have prepared a three page handout just on perennial salvias um, that include dwarf selections and taller selections. And you're gonna be amazed at the numbers that are out there. The breeding on salvia in recent years has gone crazy. And so some of the breeding that's occurred is to develop shorter varieties. We're gonna show you some of those coming up varieties that you could use in your rock garden. In fact, I have one of the Bumble series, the white one blooming in my rock garden today. Um, and um, there are others that are in that really low height. So they're great for front of the borders or rock gardens, but there's many other taller salvias. In fact, there's a whole group of salvias that were introduced by the famous garden designer, Pete Oldoff, um, that are out there on the market. And so if you can't, if you see one on this list that you can't find locally, I will bet you that you will find it um, online instead of at local garden centers because there's no physical way that one garden center can carry all of these cultivars for the homeowner to purchase. Um, and there's there's just and there's amazing series. There's the Color Spires collection. There's the Merlot collection. There's the New Dimension, the Swifty, the Marvel, the Sensation, Bumble. It goes on. Um, and so, I don't think it's coming out to you today, but in a day or two, um, Laura is going to arrange to email you that list um, so that you can look at it. And it lists the cultivar name, the color and the height that those plants will get so that you can choose one that will fit in with your um, other perennials um, that will be near that plant. I need another sip of water. Any more questions? I don't think so. I think, uh, well, um, Senshu does say that she has heavy clay and had overwatered her um, White Hill and Blue Hill. So that was okay. good advice. Thank you. Okay. All right, so Mexican sage and hummingbird sage. This is a nice compact annual for us to grow. And in recent years, the, the Summer Jewel series has come out and the, the hummingbird or the nymph series has come out. Um, no, it's actually the hummingbird series, excuse me. Um, so that they're providing different colors. The traditional Salvia cocinea is um, just a green foliage with the red flower spikes. But if you look at hummingbird forest fire, you'll see some of the breeding that's occurred in there where you have the dark uh, maroon to chocolate colored bloom stems that then make those red flowers just pop. And then in addition, they've developed white and pink and lavender colors um, that are out there. You can buy these and start them from seed, but you would need to have done that in March. But you will find a lot of the hummingbird sages, not necessarily all these cultivars that you see here, but you're probably gonna find at least one of them at your local garden center. So this was listed later. Just think about, you know, British expansion. Here we go, 1778 when botanists that have come to the new world, to the Americas, are starting to explore. And so you have in the late 1700s and into the 1800s, a lot of the American or um, North American and Central American um, species being um, identified or being collected as samples and then being sent to Linnaeus in, in um, Let's see, Sweden, yes. Okay, it's native to South and Central America, the West Indies and Mexico, and it's a great bedding plant. It would be good to use in containers. 
Now, I wanted to show you, because salvias are grown all around the world, this is an image of um, mature salvia in Israel. And notice how the foliage is a dark greenish gray. This is in a this is a semi-arid climate, and so what it doesn't matter if it's a salvia or whatever, plants that grow in arid or semi-arid climates, um, whether they're cactus or not, cactus will often have silvery or gray hairs on them. Uh, plants that grow there tend to have a silvery or gray color to the foliage simply to reflect the heat of the sun off of them and those hairs help protect against moisture loss. So this is Dominica sage. Um, I found this image online um, and although it's not hardy in here, this would be one if you, for example, live in the Anoka um, County sand plains up there, this is one if you can get seed online, you might wanna try out there, try up there in your sandier soils. Um, to enjoy these um, spikes of white blooms. Okay, this is what we were planting this morning. This is a annual that's again been in the floral trade as far as being able to be purchased at garden centers, probably here in the US since the late 1800s. It was first listed in 1837. This is when some of the plant explorers are getting down to Mexico. Um, and the Texas area. And farinacea means flowery because if you look at the leaves, the leaves have are looks like they're almost coated um, with, with a flower uh, feature to them. The same thing can happen on some of the flower stems, particularly the white ones. So they come in shades of white, blue, silver, violet. Um, and they usually grow 18 to 24 inches tall. There's several series out there with different colors. The cathedral um, evolution you see in the upper right-hand corner, a beautiful um, violet purple. Um, I saw this on the St. Paul campus. So you'll see a photo of it coming up where it was planted with hot pink uh, New Guinean patients. So um, again, hot sun, these can tolerate much drier soils. They won't like wet soils. Um, you'll see them along the Pacific Coast Highway in California when you're on your way up to Big Sur. Um, they're just a really great perennial uh, out there. Here they're an annual. Now, the red Texas sage salvia gray guy, if you look, you see the tinier leaves. Um, you'll see a number of colors out there, white, um, orangey red, pink. Um, again, listed in the late 1800s. This is a plant whereby when we get shorter days, which start June 21st, um, and cooler weather, which is mainly in the fall, it will slow and stop flower production. But in the heat of the summer, this is gonna be a knockout. So we have several series out there, the heat wave, Mirage, um, Navajo, Savannah, and Stampede. Even the names are hinting to you the heat that they like. Now. This has really been the knockout group that's come and brought people into annual salvias. The anise or hummingbird sage from Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, and Uruguay. Um, was listed in 1833, introduced to Britain in 1925, and the very first one came on the market here in 1996, black and blue. There is now another variety called black and bloom, that's supposed to bloom longer, but I've talked to other gardeners and they found that black and bloom doesn't bring in as many hummingbirds as the earlier variety black and blue. Um, you've got Wendy's wishes, love and wishes, purple and bloom. These are great for getting your hummingbirds um, in the late later summer, fall, when they're starting to migrate south, but they will bring in um, butterflies and moths also. Even the, even the bees with long tongues cannot get down to the nectaries of this. These grow to be three feet tall by three feet wide. And then here's the Mexican bush sage that I'm gonna to try to get a hold of um, to put on my deck for a hot sunny area. Amazing blooms. Uh, the flowers are more white with a hint of violet, but then they have these um, 
calices that are a deep, deep purple can grow quite tall. So you might want to give it a try. Another one of the very tiny um, Southwest US uh, and Central American species that has tiny leaves uh, is the baby sage or black currant sage. It's grown in Central Mel uh, Mexico as a medicinal plant and also used for making tea. It's great for hot sunny containers, planting next to heat sinks like driveways, uh, sidewalks, etc. Native to southeastern Arizona and Mexico, and it's frequently hybridized with Salvia gregii. Here's my favorite. This is gentian sage. Uh, Blue Angel is the one that you're going to see in uh, independent garden centers in six packs. Um, it was introduced to horticulture in 1838 from central Mexico. You can see the uh, the map down there of their native range. And it is, in my mind, it's the most brilliant and the largest of all salvia blooms you will ever get on a plant. There is a series out now called the Patio Series, um, but you can see the images of some of the older uh, that are still available, um, cultivars, Blue Angel, Cambridge Blue, which is a much softer blue, uh, Chilcombe, Guanajuato, Oxford Blue, and White Trophy. I have yet to see Chilcom um, and growing anywhere, but I'm sure it's out there. So the old fashioned scarlet sage, which comes from the mountains of, of southeastern Brazil, <clears throat> here is you can see it done in mass plantings. You have heights that range from about 10 inches in height um, up to close to three feet. And under extreme heat and drought, um, Salvia splendens will drop its flowers as a protective mechanism. And then as soon as the weather cools and or they get moisture, they will send up new flower spikes. And obviously after World War II, when what Russia was in control, red varieties were widely planted in Eastern Europe. So we see some of the series here, Lighthouse, which get about 18 to 22 inches tall, Reddy, Sizzler, Vista, Rambo, I forgot to put in here, Rambo can get up, I think, about 18 inches also. Now, the interspecific salvias, their crosses. Upper right-hand corner, I just got a flat of Roman red to plant in various spots. This is what I think is the most amazing red salvia out there now. This plant will grow 24 to 40 inches tall and about two and a half to three feet wide, and the flowers will, will tower way above the foliage. Um, these, some of these other varieties or uh, series you might have trouble finding because they're just coming on the market. The fashion series has pendulous fuchsia shaped blooms, again, quite tall, two to two and a half feet. The Salgoon series has, is featured for its contrasting um, colors of stem, Corolla and calyx, so the flowers pop. And the Vibe series, the flowers are much smaller. I saw a wonderful plant of this um, at uh, Wagner's Garden Center recently down on uh, Penn Avenue near the 62 Crosstown. Okay, then we have some more great blue salvias, the crosses of Longa spicata and Farinacea. These are taller plants. Um, so we have the rock and blue suede shoes, the mystic spires blue, the indigo spires, and the big blue. So look at some images here. Here's blue angel, the salvia patens. Below that, salvia's Wendy's wish, which is a goranatica hybrid. Then we have evolution that I mentioned. This was a year or two ago up on the St. Paul campus. Evolution behind a hot pink New Guinea impatience. And then below that, four different images of what Guaranatica, native to Argentina, looks like, and that's black and blue. Some more. Here you see some of the taller red salvias um, in the upper left. And then you have Greg Eye Wild Thing, which is tiny flowers, tiny foliage. Uh, on the left, you're seeing Lucantha, an image from California. Uh, in the middle, the Mexican sage Brenthurst, which is kind of a peachy pink color, and another Mexican sage, the Summer Jewel Lavender. 
annual salvias. And I'm going to speed this up because we got to get into the perennials. You see Amistad on the left, which people swear by as far as one that's fabulous because it has many more blooms um, to bring in the, the hummingbirds and butterflies. Lighthouse purple, you see, it's not the best photo from my backyard a couple of years ago, but next to Salvia or Hosta Chiquita. And then on the right, a little shorter Salvia Farinacea called Velocity. Biennial salvia, there is one we can grow here, and Rush Creek is growing these this year, so you can find them in independent garden centers. The first year they form this huge fuzzy rosette. This is a plant to put in your garden for kids to enjoy, and you put it at the front of the border or in containers. Uh, it's native to the Mediterranean basin. Um, it prefers hot, sunny locations, well drained, drier soils. If you're in the Anoka, uh, sand plains, perfect plant to consider. The second year, it will come up and send up these candelabra blooms. After it blooms, it dies, but it sheds seeds all over. So if you let it shed seeds, it'll be coming back. Perennial salvias for Minnesota. Uh, hold on just a second. Bill, can you shut the door? Okay. No more distractions in the back. Okay. But he's he's leaving. Salvia koyame, the Japanese woodland sage, comes to us from Hansha, Japan. Does that name sound familiar? Um, grows in shade or morning sun, and this plant spreads. It's a beautiful plant. Has very attractive foliage, as you can see by the lower photo. Now we're gonna look at the other perennial sages, woodland sage, meadow sage, and salvia sylvestris, which is the crosses between these two. And most times now for the perennial sages, this is listed simply as um, a, a, a salvia on, on, on cultivars because many... No, okay, we'll go on. So the benefits of salvia, we have the culinary, the medicinal, and the amazing ornamental, the fact that deer and rabbits won't feed on them, that they're a good cut flower, that they're trigger mechanism in the flower, and you can see the bumblebee up there. When it visits, the pollen deposits pollen on the backside of the visiting bees, and it will attract both bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, depending on the size of the bloom. Most of the perennial salvia are going to bring in bees and butterflies, um, and they will get hummingbirds later on in the fall. But notice also how to blend them. Um, if you work these with grasses, just as, as Pete Odoff has done in some of his amazing garden designs, you can see how the different textures um, really come together. Okay, salvia requirements for perennials, full sun, the exception is the Japanese woodland sage. Well-drained soils are important with good organic matter. Um, avoid clay soils. The perennials, um, deadhead them after they bloom, then, and by that meaning cut them back one third and then give them a shot of fertilizer and that will usually bring them back into bloom for you a little later in the season. The annual salvias thrive best in hot summers. In wet seasons, perennial salvias would be considerably taller. Last year, Sylvia caradonia was about a foot taller than it was in other years. So we're looking below here at some of the different colors of perennial salvia that are out there. Evening attire is so dark that even with the photo, um, you can see how intense deep purplish blue it is. These are some of the dwarf perennial salvia cultivars, the Bumble series. I have a number of these coming into bloom in the rock garden right below my apartment deck. And if you want to stop by um, to see that, I would suggest in the next week more will be in bloom. If you come to um, 2229 Doswell, Avenue in St. Paul's St. Anthony Park and just park on the residential side, um, then you can walk across. It's 
the rock garden's in full sun next to a staircase. And right now I have bumble snow is, is already come into bloom. So that must be the earliest because I have, I think, every one of the bumble series in my rock garden. Some others, the profusion series that was introduced by Walters Gardens. Um, and again, these do rebloom re heavily. The uh, dwarf perennial ones provided you cut them back immediately after they flowered so they don't start developing seed and then give them a little shot of fertilizer. Some of the other dwarf salvias include sweet petite. And what's been going on with these breeding in salvia is to develop much larger blooms. Um, you have Marcus, which was one of the earliest ones out, uh, Rose Marble, Blue Marble. So many dwarfs there. And the newest one out um, as far as salvia that's also compact is Spring King. I have not seen it locally this spring anywhere, but I imagine by next year they will be there. Uh, this is the very first salvia to bloom in the spring, so it would precede the, the bumble snow that I just mentioned. So let's look at some of those other cultivars. And this is maybe, maybe 3% of the varieties out there, but you have, and many of these have been bred um, by, by U.S. growers, the Walters Gardens ones have been bred by Hans Hansen, um, but you're seeing the images of many of these here. And I think we're gonna be sending a link out, Laura, that has the whole PowerPoint on it so that people can have a longer time to look at the blooms, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, so we're gonna quickly get through this so we have time for questions. but just showing you some of the many ones that are out there. Um, and again, most of them are being bred with these contrasting colored stems, usually purplish black to maroon to really showcase um, these varieties. And then these are Pete Odoff's introduction. He introduced a separate species, Salvia verticillata purple rain. I did see that blooming naturally in Israel last year. Um, but look at some of these colors out there. Um, and Anja is his wife's name, so he chose his best, dear Anja. And, and I know that's out there, but I think on many of these, you're gonna have to find them online um, because there's no way the garden centers are gonna carry them all. If you live in St. Paul and Minneapolis, I would suggest you check with the Highland Nursery and with Kelly and Kelly Nursery which is out in Long Lake, Minnesota, um, because both of them carry a huge selection of genera of many different perennials. So we're gonna wind up with Salvia Transylvanica, the Transylvanian sage, um, which I'm talking to the growers at Rush Creek and say, I think you should start featuring this next year. I give them some hints now and then and sometimes they do, and sometimes they appropriately ignore me, but most of the time they go ahead. So Transylvanian sedge has mainly lower uh, leaves uh, that are very felty, um, and they form a tight rosette, and then the flower spikes come up above. And I found in the past that they often may need some staking, but if you use shrub staking with them, um, you, you won't have to, to put the ugly stakes in and wrap them around with something. This was first introduced into horticulture in the 1980s, and the cultivars that are out on the market are blue cloud and blue spires. So, Zalvia verticillata, the lilac sage or world sage, you see the image of it blooming there in Israel, and down below is purple rain, the one introduced by Pete Odoff, and more likely it happening or getting named during the time of our, oops, I went too far, um, our famous musician here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, there's a new selection out called, that has more of a smoky purple flower. Um, excuse me, no, the smoky purple is purple rain. And then there's a lighter lavender violet called Endless Love. Um, they both grow to about 20 inches. My neighbor has them in bud right now. So I would imagine in a week or two, they'll be in bloom uh, native to Central Europe and Western Asia. Described again very early on by um, Linnaeus. Um, and then if you want to check out the research on the possible uses for this species for depression, 
depression, I have a link there. Okay, pretty soon I can take another drink. So just wanted to show you um, that when I mentioned earlier at the beginning about how many of the salvias have a candelabra branching, um, here's an image of the Knesset menorah um, in Jerusalem, and then an image of Salvia Palestina um, showing how that branches when it's in bloom. So back in the 1920s, Professor Ephraim Haryoveni of the Museum of Biblical and Talmudic Botany at Hebrew University at Mount Scopus in Jerusalem noticed the uncanny resemblance of this salvia, which is native to Israel, to the shape of the menorah. And in fact, if you read Exodus 25, 31 through 36, completely describes in botanical terms branches, calyxes, petals, and cups. Um, and though varieties of salvia grow throughout the world, some species in Israel do indeed resemble the menorah if it's placed on a flat surface. And then his son went through to establish a 400 acre biblical garden preserve between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And that's something on my, my bucket list for the next time we travel there. So, and this is from an article from the New York Times. So we are at the end of the presentation and now we're ready for questions. Yeah, okay, we do have a few questions here. Um, one is, are there varieties that would do well in part shade? Um, it depends on when you're getting the shade. Um, if you're getting the shade in the morning and you're getting hot afternoon sun, I think any of these salvias would do well. You can try them otherwise in um, part shade, you know, for morning sun, but I don't think they're going to do as well for you. Okay. Um, Doris would like to know, when you purchase flowering salvia from garden centers, should you cut the flowers when planting them? It depends, you know, if, now is, was this about perennial salvia? Or uh, I believe so, I think it came in during okay. perennials. Okay, so perennial salvia, I would not cut them back if they're blooming because they generally bloom in the spring and then you cut them back after they finish blooming, give them a shot of fertilizer and they will come again later in the season. If they are annual salvias and if they're way stretched out, um, or they just have a single vertical stem, I would cut them back because that will encourage them to branch and you'll get many more annual blooms. Great. I'm going to try not to butcher these names, um, but does Selvia cosinia seed in Minnesota for next year? Uh, where would you, you could get seed online? Um, Selvia cosinia seed you won't find in in grocery stores, hardware, garden centers, because you have to start salvia seed in March. And most of those places don't put out their seed packets, you know, until April and May. So okay. this is something you would order online. Okay, I think she's asking if they self seed. Oh, if they self seed. Um, I have never seen them do that because the seed is pretty tiny. And as a result, you know, just the process of you pulling them out in the fall after a frost um, and disturbing the soil, the seed probably gets too deep in the ground in order to germinate. They almost have to be barely covered with soil to germinate. Okay. Okay. Um, so do Koyami grow in clay soils? Koyami, <laughs> Savia? Um, it's more of a woodland sage. So if you think about a woodland and how it's loose soil and it's rich with, you know, years of decaying leaves coming down because nobody's breaking the woods. Um, I don't think it would do really well, but you know, if you take your clay soil and add lots of organic matter, I'd give it a try and then you can report back to us. Yeah, okay. Great. Um, Tom has a question here. Uh, could you quickly repeat the nurseries that carry a variety of perennials? I think you okay, mentioned Kelly so and Kelly. Kelly and Kelly in Long Lake, Minnesota, which is a western burb of Minneapolis. And then in St. Paul, the Highland Nursery, which is down on West 7th Street, which is also called Fort Road, pretty close to Montreal Avenue. 
Okay, great, thanks. Um, one more question, it's from Brian. What is the best fertilizer to use after deadheading? Liquid or granular application? Um, I would recommend granular because if you get liquid sprayed directly and if, if you miss and get it on the foliage, then you will likely burn the leaves. Um, if you can apply it basally to make sure it's just getting into the soil, that would be fine. But you want to use a very, um, way to put this, um, moderate source of nitrogen. So like a 10-10-10 granular fertilizer or on the liquids, they're often smaller um, ratio fertilizers. So they may that be down like four, four, five, nine, whatever. Um, you definitely don't want to go up into the turf type fertilizers where the nitrogen, which is the first number in that ratio, is usually between 18 and 20 percent. What you will do is just encourage a huge amount of foliage growth and you probably won't get any second bloom. Okay, thank you. Well, those are all of our questions today. Thank you so much, Mary, so much great information. And thanks to everyone for attending today. Um, after the webinar, we will be sending you a survey. We would appreciate it if you would complete that and send it back. We really appreciate all your feedback. Um, you'll also receive a follow-up email with um, a link to today's recording and the handouts that Mary talked about. That should come, in, come out within 24 to 48 hours. So on behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and our presenter, Mary, Thank you so much for joining us today and stay safe, everybody. Thanks, Mary. You know.